Good morning or evening, wherever you may be. Hey, Jeffrey. Good morning. Hey, Tal. Hey, Taylor. Good morning, everybody. Give it just a, another minute or two and then we can kick things off. All right, we're a couple minutes in. I think we can go ahead and kick things off. Taylor, do you want to start with the um, least privilege best practice? Well, uh, we can. I was Ian's running a, a bit late, hoping he'd join here. Um, are, does anyone have anything else they'd like to add? to the agenda before we get going. If you haven't written it, do you want to verbalize it? 
All right. All right. Yeah, so I guess if no one has anything else, then I'm good with starting, Jeffrey. Okay, do you want to give a generic overview? Um, yeah, so this is, um, I guess just to start, this is related to the least privilege discussions that we've been having. Um, least privilege, there could be principle, I guess, the least privilege principle. We could have a, several best practices that could come out of this. And it seemed like no root in containers would be one um, that should be um, pretty reasonable to have agreement on. And we can work on others, of course, but this would be a first. And maybe the other thing about this was if we can get, get a few best practices um, in there, um, into the repo, then it may be easier for other people to read. So you're looking at, um, we have a template and we have the only one there is not really a best practice, it's the process. So it's harder to look at that than uh, if you're the type of person that likes to start from examples. So I, it's twofold, get this best practice in and have it as an example. Um, anyways, so the, the, it has all the sections except for the user story section. Um, there's a lot of other content, so we're pretty close to writing out an actual user story. We we'll probably link that to a new PR for that, but it has all the other sections, including a, a pretty, um, pretty extensive reference section for going out to what other people have talked about on this one. Um, but yeah, the, the general idea would be not having any processes in, in a container that are running as root so that they can, they would, if anything goes wrong, they're less likely to cause damage primarily to themselves since there is some isolation uh, being in a container. And potentially if there's any type of shared resources, like a containers, multiple containers in a pod, and there could be some type of damage if there's not isolation between those, but that's the main idea. And, and then when you're thinking about running a process that's non-root and what you're having to do as far as dropping privileges, then it, it just moves you towards that whole mindset of um, running with the, the least capabilities necessary to uh, get the job done. Um, some environments, uh, SE, like SE Linux based environments requiring dropping root privileges. So if, if you're already building your application to not require root, then you should be good to go in those type of environments. Um, yep, that would, that kind of covers it. Um, we have the proposal section talk about when you're building a container and how that's related and uh, what, you, what you can do, um, some of the trade-offs, I guess, would be um, the first process um, by default may be running as root, so you have to think a little bit more. I guess it's a little bit more work up front. There may be upstream images that didn't think about uh, setting 
the user, the UID and GID so that, so that they're not root, uh, which means if those are your base configurations, you would have to take that into account if you're building on an existing upstream image. Uh, and then do modifications in your own Docker file, et cetera. And um, you know, most of it's just around the, I guess the extra work required and does a process expect things to be root owned and the file system, like where, wherever it's accessing and making sure directories and stuff are uh, owned by the user that you create, so. Um, let's see. And this would be a workload context. <clears throat> if, and I'm talking while you're showing your screen, Jeffrey, would it be better if I showed my screen while I'm talking to different yep. points? All right, let me do that. Let us know when you want us to like jump in too. Oh yeah, totally. Any, if you want to jump in, uh, I guess the last part was just the workload. I can't share my screen unless you stop. There we go. Cool. Um, right. So if this is just looking in the, the diff display diff view. And yeah, there's all the references, different places. Um, workload context. So this would be everywhere is by default and pretty straightforward on a test plan. But there's a, a split between doing static analysis and and then runtime analysis for um, stuff like did they set user um, the run commands allow you to express the user and other things like that so there's things you can look at before the, the CNF starts running and then you can do various things with the runtime analysis. Um, Vaco has some stuff with CNCF project and there's other projects out there that can try to look at the environment, see if any containers are running with root. Um, yeah, and so I guess that's it. If folks have questions. I don't think there's, oh, I guess there has been some comments. So I guess before going through those, I could. I apologize uh, when I looked okay. through um, my browsers this morning, I realized I never actually submitted my review. So. Oh, all right. My stuff will come if it's, soon. If it's in draft, you can hit submit. Uh, I, I didn't write this as a comment, but maybe uh, I'll just raise it now. Um, Another issue I thought about is uh, it's quite ra rare, but there are uh, pods that use system D. Various reasons to do it. It's not so simple to set up, but it, you, you can definitely set it up. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, you, you might be running system services that are root. Um, so it's not, you know, you not, your main entry point might not be root. But there might be, <laughs> yes, there might be things running in root anyway. Um, and I can think of uh, other things, uh, uh, cron jobs, you know, it could also be through system D. It doesn't have to be system D, right? It could be any kind of a uh, uh, system service. Um, but Paul, given, even in that case, do you need the root user or do you need privilege uh, permissions on, on that? kind of process? It, it could be either. System D can run uh, uh, user jobs. Um, but usually the reasons you want it is probably because you need some sort of specific system service that is that is root. Um, yeah, that, that's a good call out as well. Root does not necessarily mean privileges. You can you can have root without without privileges, or you can have privileges without uh, without root. So um, we we probably want to make sure that we have guidance for for both uh, for both sides. Well, yeah, but that might just be that you're not compliant with this best practice. You've always got that option. Um, but for things like that, why do you need to be root? 
Well, I, I, the only mention, I don't know. <laughs> there might be a million reasons and, and you can always find another okay. reason. I'm, I'm only mentioning oh. this. We talked about Docker files and you know, it, if that's the kind of test methodology that looks specifically at entry points. And um, yeah, when it, you're talking right, about comprehensive. When, when you're talking when you're talking about init systems, on occasions, and I don't know how system D is implemented here, but uh, many init systems make the assumption that they're PID, um, that they're the lowest PID, and if they're not the lowest PID, then they'll fail at doing what they want to do by by design. So it may not be uh, it may not be an issue in system D, but there are init systems where uh, your your PID matters. Your... Yeah, but that's fine. You, your PID would still be zero, one, whatever, rather. Right. I, my, my whole point here is just thinking about background services as well as, as just the entry point. That, that's I, really I, yeah, I, I, I see that. Um, but, you know, a, a background service doesn't have to run as root is my point. If system right. D for whatever reason requires being root, then you could fix system D to be compliant rather than changing the user story because, because that would be the tail wagging the dog. Exactly. No, my, my point is that maybe in the best practice, we can add wording about um, as well as background services, including system D, something like that, um, just to make sure that it, that it's covered as well. Yeah, and um, just to remind and people to double check your thinking. And, um, and another thing, the, these are guidelines, so pe people can escape them if they if they need to. Um, mm. so. I was going to say, so one of the things it's we should like, consider capturing, right, is um, we should limit like one best practice per input here, right? Um, I think that there's a bunch of best practices that could come out of this. If we, you know, agree and move forward that running is root when you don't need to as a best practice, then we should cap this one to that. Um, I do think that like when we do these live discussions, it's a good chance to talk about um, what other best practices would potentially fit to a user story or a use case. Um, so that way you kind of build a portfolio against it. Cause um, we talked about, um, you know, getting like containers from vendors. I can tell you like one of the challenges I deal with and this Ian right here is the whole black box. I'm just going to give you something that works versus, you know, yeah. I want to rip it apart. Yeah. What if you hand me a container that is defaulting to root and I come in and say the CNCF says the best practice is not to run in root. If I go in and modify the image or I add additional layers, you'll tell me I'm outside of my service contract and that, you know, I'm breaking your stuff. Um, not you specifically, I'm just talking about in general, like you hand yeah. this off. So like um, we've talked about like the clean handoffs and stuff like that before. And I think this is kind of like one of those good first case examples of um, I don't want to run stuff in root and give you access to these types of things. I mean, I have a, you know, a big multi-tenant environment. What if someone comes in, starts doing things they shouldn't, et cetera, right? So like, what does it look like when, you know, I get something from a third party that defaults to root? Yeah, so the, there's two parts to that. One is this best practice is, is audience is the CNF developer more than it is anybody else. You might care, you might say, follow the best practices when, during your CNF development. Um, but the CNF developer is the one that should care about this because ultimately running as root give or take the fact that isolation between users is not quite what it could be in Kubernetes, but ultimately the, the use of root in a container is more about your CNF, if your CNF breaks or if there's a security intrusion or, or whatever, not going completely ballistic, but it's still contained. Even with root privileges, it's still contained because um, it's only container root. It doesn't get you out of the container. Um, but we did say at the bottom of this, this is how you can test compliance. If the root, if the first user it starts with is not root and there are no set SID um, files in the file system, then nothing is ever going to be able to get to root for one. Uh, and the other one is we said, well, there are monitoring systems. And uh, I think we gave a couple of examples which double check to make sure there aren't any local root processes running as well. Um, so you have it's not your job to change it. It's your job to say that I gave you a list of instructions, um, you know, a set of acceptance tests, and you're not passing them. Um, and so, you know, that is a different thing from I'm going to break my um, support contract by, you know, making 
changes to the software. Instead, you're saying you haven't met your acceptance test and the deliverable is, deliverable is not acceptable, I'm not paying you, which gives you the leverage you're looking for. Yeah, I, I don't think it's quite that clean in the real world because product people <laughs> like to come up with deadlines and you know things need to go to market and all this. Um, I think in an ideal world, that's how it would work. Um, and like you said, this being for developers, like we've talked about this in the past, right? Like people will probably look at these repos and bake some of this stuff into an RFP, right? So like mm. um, ideally you would solve this as part of like an onboarding process, um, but yeah, it doesn't and you're work on, that and way. So then you're on, I think your onboarding process should not say if I find rooty sort of signs in your containers, I will reverse them. Your onboarding process should say, I will detect these things and flag a non-compliance. Um, you, you aren't, there is no winner if you if I supply you A when you're wanting B, right? There's no way for you to get B out of A. I either have to supply B or you have to modify it. And neither of those things you're saying is in the real world going to be anything anyone's going to be happy about, absolutely. But um, the levers are there. Yeah, and in the... Uh, I'm just wondering... This negotiation is just going to be tricky, right? Because this is going to come down to the system operator telling the software developer how to develop. And then you're going to have someone who comes and I'm just playing devil's advocate for a second. Cause I, yeah. I do, I think this was a good start. I think that this needs a lot more meat in it. Um, cause like you're going to have the person who's like, listen, Mr. Telco, don't tell me how to write my software. Cause they're going to come up with examples like Pal just gave of, you know, I've got this or that running and I have to have it because of this. And so yeah. I'm just curious. And, 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 and that, that's a slightly different thing. And I think something we need to write up at some point as well, which is um, for anything like this, where you've got best practices. And again, I'm talking about when I used to work in, well, safety critical systems, you are allowed to basically deviate from the standard as long as you write it down and the receiving side accepts what you've written. So um, we need to, at some point, come up with how you document what you are compliant with in our best practice baselines. And if you are not compliant, you write down what you're not compliant with and, you know, should you so choose why you are not compliant because you're making an argument that the, the receiver should accept what you've given them regardless of the fact that you're not compliant because, you know, because presumably it's no worse than it would otherwise be. I mean, we had ridiculous things like pretty much don't use pointers in C. You can imagine how well that goes down. Um, so um, there were non-compliances we used to have to write in our software and it would have to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis by whoever we were selling that software to. So on this point though, and the point to my ramble is um, if you go to the goal section, um, Taylor, that the tie, yeah, there we go. Um, I would, um, I would make this a little bit more like flushed out and like succinct, like just clearly, to, I mean, I feel like the second bullet's pretty, um, pretty clear cut, but like the first one doesn't really read like a goal. Um, so I would just call out like distinctly, these are the goals we're trying to achieve with these best practices. Then if you go down to the test plan, um, and this gets to your exact point, Ian, does, when we talk about the, like- our, the, When you're saying the goals, like we may, the summary, pieces, the motivation and goals, there's a lot of overlap between those. You feel like- Yeah, but it all um, kind of like reads weird. Like, I, I don't know, I put some comments in like, like motivation, like it says both the benefit, like it's two succinct sections, but then like you're kind of like just inferring from the summary and the motivation, which depending on how you attack this, it just reads weird. So um, all right. I would like make you each section a stand a little bit more strict. Let's look at, did you actually yeah. put the comment in? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll give you okay. and Ian some more direct feedback. I read this over the weekend and then, like I said, I forgot to hit submit, hence the uh, 16 minutes ago thing. But, um, and then like, just real okay. quick, I wanna stay on like this original point. Um, so okay. clearly, very clearly defining the goals. So that way someone knows what this best practice is striving to achieve. And then in the test plan, um, and once again, this is one of those things where like when I first made my comment, like if you actually look into static and runtime analysis, it gets a little like you're kind of doing some inference from like some things. But like I think instead of being like 
too generic. Like for the actual test plan, I would like actually write out like some expectations. And then I put in a comment, um, we've established that this group isn't specifically about writing code, um, but there is this CNF test suite. I think um, like if we put like test plans together that like validate that a um, best practice has been achieved or whatever, A, this gives somebody to like grade themselves against to Ian's point. So then if they say, we're just not gonna do this, they can point to exactly where they're making their compromises. And -hmm. then additionally, if people did want to get more um, on the code contribution side, they theoretically could automate some of the test plan and then, Mm -hmm. you know, contribute that back to the CNF test suite. So gives our group a way to tie into some of the other groups and for the people who want to write some code. But um, I I think if we keep the test plan too generic, then like the best practices, like, because you put somewhere down in the bottom too about like evaluating CNFs, this and that. I mean, um, if well, I just well, run I'm, I'm confused here because that test plan is pretty specific. It tells you exactly what you look for. Mm, I mean, I think maybe we just have different definitions of the test plan. Like, I I get that it tells me what I'm looking for. It doesn't give lay out a plan of what I'm testing. It, some of that is in the static and runtime analysis. Like I said, there's some inheritance between the um, different like subsections, but well, like, um, I would write like. Uh, that's what I want to hear. What would you write? I would write like, you know, expected inputs and outputs, and this is what we're expecting, right? Like, and some of that, like, see user and run commands. Um, some of that, like I said, is in the static analysis. But like, I mean, a test plan to me infers that there is a plan that you're executing against, and then that would have predefined inputs and outputs to I, validate whether or not you got I the agree. results. That you well, were well but then the, the test plan is effectively. Ian? I think maybe the name of this section is um, not good. By saying test plan, if if we take like the definitions of that people are going to use that are actually writing tests, it probably has a more specific thing, which I think is what you're saying, um, Jeffrey. So maybe the whole section is um, just named wrong versus we're going much higher level, like a, yeah, a business I, well, level expectation. I, I, I agree with that. I'll add that um, I, I read this originally as this is this is not a best practice. This is a principle, right? We we intend to derive best practices from this. So talking about test plans here a little bit jumped the gun for me because a, a best practice um, in my the tone is different. It's if you want to do this, then you should probably do this. And here we're we're taking this principle and saying, well, this is the rule right now, and right. there's a compliance suite. <laughs> this is maybe. A, <laughs> Are here. I, I, I'm a little confused by what you mean by that. I mean, the best practice is literally don't do this thing. And the test plan says, I will look to make sure you are not doing this thing. Um, and the test plan is written in such a way that it is testable by, you know, code. Um, I mean, I wouldn't care if it was testable. I wouldn't be happy, but I, it would at least be acceptable if it was had to be tested by a human being. But it is testable by code in this instance. Um, the test plan talks in generic terms because it isn't a test, it's a plan. Um, you know, I'm not writing you code to do the test and embedding it in the document. I'm telling you how the code goes about what it does and what it's looking for. So when you say it's a principle, not a best practice, the principle is least privilege, which isn't written in here. The best practice is do not run anything as root, um, which is a yes, no answer. Are you running things as root? Yes, no. Can I test whether you're running things as you root? Yes, no. If these tests pass, you are not running things as root. There is no way you can get to root. So. I think I'm arguing with both of you, but I I mean, starting with Tal, why is this a principle and not a best practice? I, well, if it is a best practice, I'm a little worried then too with the tone. Um, I didn't read it that way. Why? Because sometimes you do need to use root and then the question is, okay, what guidance can we give to people? For example, uh, pods, I'll I'll give you one example, right? A, A pod does not need to have one kind of container. It could have multiple containers. But the way Kubernetes works, privileges are granted per pod and not per container. So one best practice could be if you do have a container that needs root, you want to isolate it maybe into a pod rather than mix it with, uh, uh, with other containers that do not need root, right? So to, to reduce the attack surface, if we will, if you want to talk security. Um, it, if you need to use systemd, then use systemd with a user rather than root, right? There are all these things that you can- Why do 
I need root in a container? I don't know. There, there is a zillion reasons I can think about in terms of, of uh, specifically network functions, interactions with the host, the operating system. At some point, you'll probably need to do that somewhere. And the idea is to isolate it. So, so the principle is least, right? It doesn't mean zero. Uh, somewhere, there, there will need to be some sort of privilege. So then the questions are, do you want it to be even a workload on Kubernetes? Should it be something like a CNI plugin that runs on the host rather than a workload, a containerized workload. There, there are a lot of questions here that I think are very interesting and that we could provide guidance. Uh, the, the idea of jumping to compliance about containers seems to me uh, going to some very specific use case here. To me, to me it looks like a, a step too far. We're, we haven't even established compliance and what that could mean and why a compliant application has to have all containers avoid the use of root 100%. Um, Ian, hey, Ian, maybe um, this word right here, we don't have enough context. I think what you were meaning when we put this in, inside a compliant application, I think that's compliant to this best practice. Correct. Not compliant to all things. Yeah. So the suggestion then, and maybe we could write it to be more explicit like that. So then we're saying, if this is a best practice, then um it just because you don't follow this best practice doesn't mean that the entire cnf or application is not cloud native or anything else we're saying try to avoid using root not when you can't so if you can have a best practice that you decide is doesn't work for you and that's fine just yeah, saying I in think, general, in right, general, and, and we're saying people. try to avoid. Yeah. And then help and, people explain, well, how do you avoid to use root? I think that's what I, I look for guidance here. I, I'm not oh, looking for okay. somebody to tell me what not to do. I'm trying, well, I this is how I work. You know, I need root at some places. Well, yeah. if not root, what can I'm you suggest? I, I yeah, disagree like, a little bit, Cal. I, I, I want to disagree on that point. Like, I think we're supposed to be providing guidance. I think Taylor hit the nail on the head, though. And I don't necessarily think this needs to stop like a PR from being accepted, but like, I think that there is not enough context. Taylor, you used the right word. It's like, you, you need to like, like I said, I think the goals need to be very, very clearly and succinctly stated independently. Like you get this, this, and this, this is what we're, you know, achieve, we're seeking out to achieve with this best practice. I mean, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't, I slightly disagree with you, Tal, and like, um, I do think we should be somewhat prescriptive because you can just choose not to follow this best practice and be like, these are my reasons why. I just don't think there's enough context in this for someone to cleanly articulate their reasons why. Um, um, like what are the yeah. trade-offs, you know? Well, well, well let me, let me we don't say have... what I intended for a second and see what you read in because it might not have come across in the document. The thing that Container Roots lets you do, literally the only thing it lets you do because most of the things that Root can do really aren't allowed in containers, is it lets you change, it lets you read, write, and change permissions any file in the file system, um, which is probably not what you want. Um, you can't stop anything that's got root from doing that. So every file system protection you put in place is thrown out the window. Um, and so if you wish your file system protections to mean anything, then you should not run anything as root. But, but what if what if you do want to change a, a file system <laughs> installed file for for whatever then, reason? You, then you just don't use this best practice, Tal. So you use like, it. You give, it like, ownership, you give ownership of it to a different user that can change the file. So um, I think I think part of the way to to look at it is I think there is a context issue here. Um, what I would recommend do, doing is separating this up into first. Uh, from a test perspective, uh, we, we need to be able to say that this thing is an audit mode versus this thing is an enforce mode. And, get, and that gives the, uh, the uh, various groups the capability to pick and choose the things, the best practices or future compliance things if they exist, the ability to set their, their policies and baselines so they can then uh, discover and, and, and optionally enforce things that they care about. Mm. Uh, the, the other thing as well is 
uh, you look at it from a vendor and consumer perspective, the vendor will say, I, I have verified or ran some verification program that, uh, that has given me information about whether this thing meets certain requirements. And uh, the test bed can, can help there. What it doesn't do is it doesn't say whether this thing is fit for purpose by the consumer, whether it's valid, whether it's a, whether it's a validated system. That's something that the consumer, uh, in this case, uh, Jeffrey and his team would have to work out is this thing fit for purpose. And this is where the, we, we wanna have some of the best guidance or best practices to say like, uh, is it fit for purpose? Is it fit for purpose from a security perspective? Just use that as an example. In which case you could say, we want, we, we want no root. We want to have privilege escalation disabled. Um, there's actually a privilege escalation we did within Kubernetes that doesn't allow you to, that turns off the suet or ignores the suids, uh, the suid bit. We want to drop all capabilities except for the ones that are absolutely minimum that you've compartmentalized. Uh, and some of it is through, through the mixture of the verification and validation combined. Ideally, you should get to somewhere that is, uh, that is, uh, uh, Cons consumable, but at the same time, you provide that, that information out. So uh, it ends up becoming a conversation between the two and not, a, not an enforcement, which I, I don't think we'll have the ability to do from here. Right. I, I just want to point out one thing, too. I, I don't think that it's a zero-sum game. Like, I think both Ian and Cal can have what they want. I think, Ian, if you do a better job of describing in this document what you just described in words, then we say, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve with this best practice. Hmm. Then if Tal has an exception, we shouldn't write the best practices with the mindset of all these exceptions, but we should just tell you just be to say like, look, this is what this best practice is seeking out, hmm. but dot, 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 I have to do this. Therefore, I'm going to run this container as root. And then you yeah. say, okay, I accept that risk because Tal needs to accomplish X, you know, but hmm. like we shouldn't water down the best practice in my opinion, Tal, because we know that the exceptions are coming. We should just make sure that the best practices clearly state what they're trying to do. So that way, when you do want to make the exception, it's easier for you to articulate that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think my point is, uh, as others have said to you, that there's, there's room for more context here and more guidance, I would say, and more, yeah. um, uh, I, I think, you know, Je Jeffrey, you said it reads a little bit weird. I, th I think the tone is just, uh, the word compliance, I find a little bit scary, right? I, I could easily see a telco taking this and saying, okay, you, you need to do this. There's a, a, a test oh, suite. It, and it, it does, it does we fall can under compliance. Re, we, though, can re, so. we, we don't have to do uh, compliance as far as these words. It's not, well, it's not yeah. the intended thing for uh, what Ian was saying. It, so it, I would, it, let's it is remove literally. that. It is literally compliant to this best practice. And right. the word so compliant I, is a perfectly acceptable one to use there. But I think you're saying that it might come with connotations we don't want to go with. Tal, you said several times without listing them, there are reasons why you might want to use root. And I think what we're saying here is if there are reasons why you might want to root, if we can list those out, or at least as many of them as we can think of out, then right. we can give people reasons either you know you can explain to both parties well this is a reason why you would want a deviation so you should write your deviation up and explain these words dear application consumer a deviation of this nature is normal and expected you might want to just give them the green light on that or, or alternatively have you thought of this alternative way of doing it that doesn't require root that would also be another thing you could do but, uh, there are um your example of systemd, to take an example, is basically saying there is software in the world that people want to use which shouldn't need root but insists upon it anyway, perhaps. Exactly. Um, so we've got to... Non-compliances are perfectly fine. Um, they are an expected part of this process, frankly. Nothing is going to be 100% compliant, at least to begin with. Um, so we just need to help people through the process of using what we write not necessarily changing this because a best practice that says well you might not care to follow the best practice is basically not best practice whereas a best practice that says this is the 
platonic ideal of a container in an application is, you know, fine. You know, it doesn't always come up to, it, it doesn't always work in the face of reality, but it is nevertheless the ideal that we should all strive towards. Yeah, the framework that is often used in this in this particular path when you start looking at overall governance uh, is you end up with policy and standards at the top. Policies are things like all data at rest must be encrypted. Uh, standard would be like we use AES. And then at the lower end, you end up with procedures and guidance. Procedures are we use BitLocker to encrypt Windows systems with AES in this way versus guidelines, which is like, don't leave your laptop in the car. Uh, the difference between the two is that procedures are always mandatory. Guidelines are optional, but very tend to be very good advice. Uh, in this scenario, we're focusing primarily on guidelines, but it is possible that in the operational side, people may elevate some of these things into, into procedures. And so we want to make sure that they're that they are testable when they can be, which gives the uh, which gives the various groups, both on the vendor and consumer side, the ability to to and audit and enforce when they want to, but ultimately those knobs become become tunable. And we focus only on guidance. We don't tell people when is when should you move up to procedures because that's that's something that the internal organizations need to work out based upon their their policies and and standards. That, that, I'll, everything you said is perfectly reasonable. I, you know, I'll just add. Um... Look, the, the user story here is TBD, right? We, we didn't really start with the user story, so we don't, we, we kind of jump, jumped a little bit ahead here. I, I, I think yeah. that the document as it stands right now just feels a little lopsided to me. It kind of jumped to the end of, okay, no root. And th there's, there's a big story along the way, starting from the user stories, stories right? And, and going towards, well, you know, the user thinks they need root, they probably don't. Um, and if they think they do, they don't realize what the problems could be and, and requiring root. So we, we kind of jumped right to, to the end rather than, 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 than building something along the way. It might be obvious, you know, to, to all of us reading this, but I, I'm not sure it will be 100% obvious to people who say, well, why not? <laughs> you know, why uh, not? This was never the intended to be released without, way. this was never intended to be released without the user story to back it up. But it's, it's marked as a work in progress. Yeah, I, I couldn't, for some reason on this repo, I couldn't make this literally a draft pull request or I would have done that. So there's definitely no suggestion to accept it. We're wanting feedback and, and the user story would go in there too. Uh, I do, uh, Ian, before you respond on anything, I would do want to point out that this section here in the trade-offs caveats notes is specifically for adding things like here are, are um, why someone would be doing something else and an exception. And then you can talk about how to deal with that. I mean, that's what this section is. And this yeah, portion or, or right we, here we, is very similar to what you're saying with system D and other stuff. So you have a container image that already uses root and already has set, set ID binaries. So that's just an example. We could, you could do a comment with the suggest edit to add some other examples uh, if you want to a section. Go ahead. I, I, I would suggest that if we're going to come up with advice on how to consume this, like for instance, those things where again, Tal's saying, you know, I've got a laundry list of reasons why I might want to use root that we don't we try not to build it into the best practice we try and keep the best practice short and sweet we come up with a guidance note that goes along with the best practice to to kind of say well you know these are things where you will probably find deviations i agree with that i think this is one example but we don't want to listen and we didn't you didn't go into like extensive here's how to how to handle that mm -hmm. I don't think we should, I, I agree that we shouldn't have all the examples of the, all the exceptions listed and how to manage them uh, as well as we how don't to like, manage, um, we, how we to wanna, change like, that. This off of what's good, right? Sorry. Go ahead, Jeffrey. No, I thought like, that was really weird. You, your thing cut out and I thought you would stop talking. I didn't mean to stomp all over you there. That was weird stuff with my headset, I think.
I was just going to say, we don't want to write things to exceptions. We want to write them to the 90%, right? And I think one other thing that would help when we talk about this context and things that we should add in is like, as you're reading these, you know that there's going to be complementary best practices that fit underneath one of these principles, right? So if least privilege is our principle, no root is one best practice, another best practice, you know, and we should like capture this and, um, you know, keep tabs on it is, you know, create users with the appropriate amount of permissions, right? This gets into Ian's point of, you know, are there going to be times when we might need to use your root? Sure. But the best practice is don't run root. Another best practice is to create the correct user with the appropriate permissions to execute the task as needed, right? And so I think when we get into some of these, like, you know, what if discussions too, um, if we just track what other best practices would complement this one and how you kind of build like the suite of best practices underneath the least privileges umbrella, some of that context is also handled. And then to your point, Taylor, we don't need to list the 5,000 exceptions of when we're going to violate this. Well, you know, guys, I'm, I'm really interested in those guidances more than, than this document, I have to say. You know, I get questions all the time, for example, people wanting to run SSH, SSHD right, in, a, in a container for various reasons, if it's accepting netcoms, if it's something else. Now, how do you do that with, without access to root? How do you update certificates? How do you do other things? Where do you put it in the build process? Um, Nobody wants to run root. I think, I think this, any decent programmer reads this and this is very obvious, right? Of course we don't want to run root, uh, but what do you want us to do instead? What do you suggest? What is the ecosystem? What is uh, an alternative to SSHD that can run in a more cloud native environment uh, without these requirements? Um, that to me is the more interesting part than this, but, 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 but fine, you know, we have to start somewhere. I'm, I'm, this is, I have no problem with with the, the principle itself. The other thing um, when I was let's reading, go. Oh. That's Tal. I, I sorry, Victor. Um, I yeah. love the idea of recommendations on how to implement something. So whether that's dealing with exceptions or people that are saying, "Oh, I I lack the best practice. Now, how do I do it in with the software I have because it's not set up for that." So helping people to actually implement sounds great. And I think that could be a new section that we could have within the CNF working group where we talk about that. Here's the best practice. And now we start, maybe, maybe this is a folder, for instance. So this would be one way to look at it. Um, just bring this up. So we don't have folders yet, but under use cases, some of these we have folders. So if we had a best practice for not using root within that folder, maybe we have, here's a bunch of other documents that talk about, what about images that use systemd? What do you do for that? And then we could talk all about that and keep it separate from the main best practice document, but allow us to add as many as we want for real situations. That, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, and I'll just remind myself and others here that we specifically picked this one because it's a low-hanging fruit that's very obvious. So, yeah, yeah it, in, in a sense, this is a very trivial best practice, right? But even here, we see that there's, uh, there's some subtlety in terms of... Um, um, actually, no, th this is non-subtle. <laughs> I think that's what's interesting about it. This is non a non-subtle best practice, right? Just don't use root. Mm. Um, it's quite blunt. It, it's deliberately quite blunt. Um, and, and again, your, your shopping list of reasons why actually, well, I might want to use root anyway. I, I, the, the ones that I would categorize as pragmatic are ones where I'm using something like systemd, which thinks it's going to be root because it's been written in a circumstance where it will always be root and it's going to be difficult to run otherwise. And I don't spend, intend to spend all the time changing it to understand that it isn't going to be root in all circumstances. Yeah. Are there use cases that fall on the other side of the spectrum where root is absolutely essential to what I'm doing and nothing else will do? Because See, the, those would be the interesting ones. The thing I like about the guidance here specifically is that I can have this thing as a test. And I'm not saying you don't do it, but in, in an audit mode, if when, I, when I'm in the process of doing an audit, uh, I, 
sorry, two different audits, uh, then I can say, well, here are the things that use root that we need to spend extra time focusing on because they do dangerous things. And it allows me to, to have teams focus on those explicit things because I know that they're, that they're high risk items. So I think part of it is uh, being very blunt here is good. Having something that's testable is good. Uh, and again, how you, how you adjust the knobs matters, uh, matters a lot. And I think part of what we need to do is make sure that we're very clear that we're developing guidance and that the guidance can be consumed in these other ways other than just enforce mode on. Um, I, I might add, you know, I said this is a very blunt uh, 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 best practice. Th there is a tiny little subtlety that I, I want to point out, and that is that um, there's been an evolution from the early days of Docker to truly cl what's cloud native in Kubernetes, right? Th there's something very cloud native about this because early on Docker was exactly about the point of isolation Sure, use root, do whatever you want inside the container because it's completely isolated. It's not the real root, it's not the host root. All you're doing is changing stuff inside the container. Uh, we're thinking about this differently. We, we've evolved our thinking over time, right? Because we're thinking about these uh, different pods, different containers working together to do something. And the kind of reliability that we want there is not you know, do whatever you want inside the container. It's remember that you're playing as part of a bigger system here. Um, so, so you're thinking about attack surfaces as being not isolated in one place, but you're saying, well, this is one dot in, inside a, a larger topology that I need to think of. So if, if I have everybody using root, I'm, I'm really, it's very hard to tame these cats. Um, so, so there's something a little bit surprising here for some people who might be new to Kubernetes and, um, you know, not, not a hundred percent obvious to, to every developer, I guess. Uh, that, that's an excellent point. And we ran into that same problem when Docker was new. So 2013, uh, a large part of the messaging that we did was uh, look at 12 factor apps. Uh, we know that they're not perfect, that they don't align to everything, but if you understand the guidance there, uh, then it'll help you achieve what you want within Docker. And I think that they're similar, that this, this can help in that same path where we're gonna get people who have never used Kubernetes. They don't know what a pod is. And we're asking them to go build CNFs. So we're gonna run into the same problem. Why do I not need, why do I not need root? Why do I not need privileges? What, why, why do I need immutable infrastructure? And providing that, that guidance as to why it's important and how it all fits together is, is crucial towards helping them be successful. Yeah, and so, it's, it's actually a huge developer problem. A lot of people work with Docker and then they think the next step is them putting it on the cloud. But the whole idea of cloud native, right? We, we're, what we're trying to say here is you have to think cloud natively from the very beginning, from your architecture, but you don't write, write a single line of code, right? Of a network function before you understand that this is going to be a cloud native network function. Well, the, the other thing that I would like to discuss is, um, well, when I was reading this particular PR, uh, I noticed this, that Docker has the user namespace remap uh, feature that you have to enable in a daemon to basically dictate to, to Docker to, to, to modify the, the, the user use when, when a new container is user uh, uses. Um, but I noticed that this feature is not supported like by like Kubernetes, or, or at least I tried to 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 run a kubespray cluster using that feature, and, and that didn't work because um, API services requires um, that that specific mapping. So I don't know if we should also. I, I don't know if if that once that this feature, this uh, user namespace remap feature is supported in Kubernetes. It's going to make sense to still um, enforcing users to not use no root uh, containers, or is it going to be um, an extra addition um, thing to consider or something like that? Uh, that's a very good point. That's another one of those, you know, when I said there are so many reasons why you might want to use root, you know, I, I don't know even where to start. Here's one potentially, right? So again, there are other things you can do instead. You know, there's there's never only one way to do something. 
Um, I, I think, Cal, though, the part that's, um, you keep coming to this point, and the part that I'm a little hung up with is, even if there are instances where we would want to use root, does that change the fact that it's still a best practice to avoid using root? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not disagreeing at, at all with this best practice. I'm, 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 I'm trying to make this document helpful. Uh, so I, I think, uh, but what we can add, we can put it as, you know, supplements to it. You know, if, if the point of this particular document is just to state the principle, uh, I'm happy with that. I think it kind of bleeds into other thing when it talks about test plans. I think that's beyond just stating the principle. That's how to enforce it. <laughs> that's a little bit different, uh, but um, I, I think I made my point. So whether people agree with me or not, I, I have nothing more to add. All, all I would say about that. Suggest edit for the test plan to remove compliant. The, the idea is do we, all best practices that anyone puts forward, we would like to be able to somehow test it. It doesn't yeah. mean that anything about enforcement, Frederick keeps saying, I've, I've said that, are you, a difference between enforcement and just notifying whether a expectation of the test is one way or another. That's all we're putting forward. When you have a best practice, can you implement it? Is it possible at all? Yes, it's possible to use root or not use root. Can you test that whether you're using root or not? Those are the, the, the main things that we want for any best practice put forward. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it's just I might have a history here with with the words, and I'm sure others do too, and CNTT and other organizations. The the word compliance is a very very big word. I mean, we we have whole teams just uh, based around compliance and and software, etc. It's it's how a difficult word. It, it's how? also an overloaded word because compliance yeah, about, to CNTT about this versus, right here. Yeah. An application which follows this best practice will not have any containers with processes running as root. Remove it, compliant it, yeah. completely. I, that's fine. I mean, it reads a little bit tautological, but again, this is a very blunt uh, best practice. It's very clear what it says. It's there in the title <laughs> to an extent. So, so yeah. yeah. So, Tal, in, in that sense, has you are considering side cards as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, sidecar is kind of it's just another pod in the container. There are also the issue of init containers. There are various ways you can put containers inside pod, a pod. The thing is that the pod concept itself is very interesting, right? It's, a, it's the pod creates a context that is shared by all the containers that are run, running in there, but the containers are still containers. They're still isolated. Uh, this is a thing by the way, a lot of people, all, right? And, Sidecars end up with the same security as the uh, as the main container. Um, exactly. Has, exactly. So right. th there's no difference. You, you give root to your sidecar, your main application has root. Uh, exactly. Or I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give a very popular example, which, you know, when people hear sidecar, they always think of Istio, right? That's the, the one uh, uh, operator and product that uses probably sidecars more than anything. The sidecar is changing the IP tables for the pod. The IP tables are used by all containers in the pod. So the sidecar is able here to use privileges, right? To, to actually redirect all the network uh, traffic coming inside and outside of the pod. It's a very powerful uh, thing to do. And that is all based on privileges, right? You're giving your sidecar the privileges to do that because you trust, you know what it's going to do. And the feature is, uh, is one that you want. So, yeah, my, my point is that there, there's, a, there's a much bigger story here than, than just uh, uh, this best practice as it is, but it's, it's still, you know, I agree with the best practice, right? You do want to not use root when you don't have to. <laughs> and if you think you have to, you probably don't. So, so there's a narrative, it's, but, but I'm okay with making it, you know, short and sweet is the word that people seem to like here. Let's make it succinct and then mm -hmm add supplemental documents that, um, that, that dive deeper. Yeah, if, if you wanna hear something really scary, um, all pods by default get the net raw capability, which means that they can read and write things directly onto the, uh, onto the network. Uh, and they need this for ping because uh, ICMP respond, responding to ICMP requires the net raw capability. So um, 
yeah, in, in short, um, the, this is, this is uh, why layering and other things like SecComp or other policy engines like Falco and similar become very, uh, become very important in, in that aspect. So uh, there, there's other topics we can jump into there as well, but uh, we want to keep this, we want to keep this on simple, uh, no worries. Right, just a quick point, sidecars actually hey, are uh, not- We're at the top of the okay. hour. Um, so let's keep adding or hold it, uh, either add right into the notes or the ticket or bring it next week to respect everyone's time. Tal, please add some stuff into the pull request um, and check out any, anything that's there as well. Add some comments. Well, Thanks, do my everyone. Best. See you next week.